let's compare side by side the proof and our code to kind of see where each thing falls in. So the first thing I want to show you is that in our formalism, we actually defined a DSL, a domain specific language for the description of Turing machines as they are, um, as they appear in the book. So in the book, you will see things such as these in quotation marks, and they're kind of like English. And what you're saying is, uh, this text here represents the source code of a Turing machine. So what does this Turing machine do? It's the neg negator that we just looked at before. So it takes an input M, where M is a Turing machine. And then what does it do? It runs age, where age is the decider. Uh, that's, here it is. So age is the decider, so it accepts if M accepts, and it rejects if M does not accept. Um, so here, age, I call age the decider D. So that's the equivalent. Uh, the decider is age here in the, in the book, but in the code is the variable D. Uh, and then what we do, we have these three lines of code. Uh, first thing you need to note is that there will be, we have to make explicit the encoding and decoding of um, code. So here, what we have, we have some input, but we also have some notion of, we have some input that is the encoding of M, right? We have to make explicit the conversion from this input to the machine. So we have this uh, special function called decode machine that takes an input and it parses that machine, right? So this is M, the Turing machine that comes from parsing the input W, right? So that's gonna correspond to this first line. So secondly, what we're doing is we're gonna run age, again, the decider, on input M colon encoding of M. Okay, so encoding of M is the input. And in our code, it's gonna be this W, right? So that means that, how do we run it? We use this call notation. So when we do call, we're calling a Turing machine and we're passing it W, that's uh, H, which is D here, and then the pair M, right? The parsed machine and the encoded machine, right? So that's why we have those two things. And then what we do, this last step here corresponds to this line here. So what are we doing? We're doing halt with, Halt, you will, you should look at the definition of halt, but it's just going to return true or reject. It's going to either accept or reject according to the Boolean. So if you give it true, it's going to accept. If you give it false, it's going to reject, right? So we're going to do what? We're going to negate the result of B. Why? Look at what we have here. The output, output the posit, the opposite of what H outputs. That is, if H accepts, reject, and if H rejects, accept. Right? So that's exactly what we're doing. Neg B is the function that you should have, I think you've used already. It negates the result of a Boolean. Right? So if, if B is true, then it returns false. And then halt with takes that Boolean and converts it to either reject or accept. So as you can see, this is exactly matches what is in the text. But now it is code. So now you should be able to... Um, have a way clearer description of what's going on. And what you will learn in homework seven is how to write these short programs, if you will, and then how to do proofs using these programs. But for the sake of today's video, I just wanted to kind of map from one to the other, right? So let's go back to the slides and see what we have. So we have, to recap, we have this call that is calling a machine with a certain input. And that is actually underneath the way you have to think of it is there is a Turing machine that takes an M. So a Turing machine, a universe, sorry, the universal Turing machine is actually just a call. It's just calling a function, right? If you think about it, what does the Turing machine do? Well, the, the universal Turing machine 
is an interpreter. So it takes the description of a machine and it takes some input and it runs that Turing machine with that input, right? So if you think, if you, if you interpret a Turing machine M as a function, that is to say that you're calling that function and you're passing an argument to that function. So you're applying M to W, right? And the way you can do that is exactly with the universal Turing machine. So then whenever you see call M with W, what you're doing is you're running this Turing machine and you're passing it this input. And the result of the whole thing, it's going to do one of three things, right? It could loop, it could accept, or it could reject. Another thing you're going to see is you're going to see this mlet construct. And the mlet construct is doing what? It's going to be, you're going to run something on the right hand side of the arrow. So it's kind of like an assignment, right? Where you're going to run P1 followed by P2. So what are we going to do? You're going to execute some program. When I say a program is a pseudocode in this mini language, right? So this would be something, it could be, for instance, call this Turing machine. You will call this Turing machine that represents P1, and then you're going to assign the result of that to X. But the result is not knowing whether something accepted, rejected, or looped, because that would be uh, problematic. In fact, the only thing you can know about P1 is whether it accepted or rejected. You can never know whether P1 looped. If you did know that, you would uh, do impossible things. So you cannot know whether some something will loop. If P1 loops, then the whole thing loops and you never run P2, right? It, it makes sense, right? If you have an in, infinite loop in P1, you could never run P2. And that's actually one of the proofs of homework seven. So instead, what you, the way you have to understand this is you will run P1. If P1 terminates, then you will assign the result of termination to X. So X will say true if P1 accepted. Uh, it will say false if P1 rejected. It will never say there's no concept of looping. Uh, and then it will run P2. So P2 only runs if P1 terminates. Another thing you will see is uh, the result return. So there's basically three constructs and you can just with these three constructs, you can do a lot of things. So the last thing is return R, which is to say you either accept, reject or loop. So if you run, if you write in caps lock accept or reject or loop, that is corresponds to returning loop or returning reject or returning accept. So that's a very basic Turing machine. Actually, what each of these things represents is a Turing machine. So calling MW represents the universal Turing machine. Red R just represents a Turing machine that either only accepts or only rejects or only loops for whatever input. And then there's this, which is combining running uh, a Turing machine P1 and then continuing and running a machine P2. So it's sequencing uh, two Turing, the execution of two Turing machines. Um, so that's how you should un understand the pseudocode uh, for the mini language that we use. And I'm going to cover this again when I give you the introduction of homework seven. Um, so now we can a bit, uh, understand this a bit better. There is also the notation, um, that we use for, um, encoded pairs and decoding and encoding. Um, so that will be always apparent on, on the actual, um, on the actual code. And it kind of mimics what you have on the pseudo on the um, on the book. So that takes care of this. So we saw all of this. We explained. So this is kind of like our pseudo Python code, and this is how we write it in Coq. Um, yeah. And in the next video, I'm gonna start the proof of theorem 422, which is to say that. A language is decidable if and only if is recognizable and co-recognizable.